We've uh, been in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, and by the end of the message uh, today, we're going to get to the glorious verses in verses 4 and 5, but I want to pick up where we left off last week. If you remember, we talked about two questions that we, uh, that we need to ask as a result of what we learned in verses 1 through 3, and just to remind you of what we learned in the context of that, let me read you again Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3 which says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest." Now, at the end of the message last week, we asked these two questions that you see on the screen. Can we blame our sin on the devil, right? As Ephesians 1, 2, 2, 1 through 3 describes the depravity of man, can we excuse our sin by blaming it on the devil? Is the famous excuse, the devil made me do it, a valid excuse for sin? And then the second question is, can we blame our sin on our bodies, particularly our genetics? Is the excuse, I was born this way, a valid excuse for sin. Now, at the end of last week's message, we answered the first one, and we concluded that the devil made me do it is not a valid excuse for sin, because as careful exegesis of verse 2 shows, the devil's rule over the earth and over the human spirit isn't primarily through direct demonic possession. Now, demonic possession is real, but that is not the primary way that Satan's rule is manifested. His rule is primarily manifested not through direct demon possession, but rather indirectly through temptations and lies that appeal to the sinful desires of the depraved human heart. Temptation and lies are the primary tools in his tool bag. They are the primary means by which Satan rules over this fallen world. As Jesus himself explained it in John chapter 8, he said, you are of your father the devil, right? There's, there's the rule of the devil over this fallen world. You are of your father the devil. First John says, the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. But how? How does Satan rule over the unbelieving world? Jesus says, you are of your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your Father. That's how he rules. In other words, we are not innocent lambs who Satan is forcing to eat the bloody and rotten meat of sin. He's not cramming it down the mouths of innocent lambs who are disgusted by it and don't want it. He's not forcing it upon innocent little lambs with innocent and good little natures. Instead, human depravity is more like a ravenous wolf whose sinful desires and rationalizations, as described in verse 3, cause us to willingly run after Satan's temptations and indulge in the debaucheries that he places before us. Satan does not have to force sin upon us. He just has to hold the red meat of sin in front of us, and we wolf it down. And we wolf it down. Why? Because we want it. You are of your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. Satan does not have to possess a person in order to get him to sin. He just has to provide temptation and opportunity, and he is very good at doing both. He is called the tempter in the Bible and the father of lies, and that is how he rules. He rules through the sinful nature, alluring the sinful nature. So yes, as verse 2 of our passage says, the world and the devil have a powerful influence on us, but verse 3 shows that Paul identified the sin nature as the determinative issue for man. Therefore, the focus of our ministry as a church is on the proclamation of the gospel, which can bring transformation to that human heart. We are not focused on so-called deliverance ministries. Because we understand that it is the proclamation of the gospel, it is the great commission of proclaiming the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ, which frees people 
from their slavery to sin and rescues them from the kingdom of darkness. Now, as I said, demon possession is real, and there are times in which we need to deal more directly with the enemy of souls. But we need to be careful lest we be distracted from the primary task of the church, which is the proclamation of the gospel by these so-called deliverance ministries. What about the second question? We now turn to the second question. What role do genetics and other biological issues have in an individual's sin, in your sin, in my sin? When a person sins, can he say, hey, I was born this way. I didn't choose this. I didn't choose this lifestyle. I didn't choose this sin. I was born this way. And are things that the Bible forbids actually things which are caused just biologically, naturally, and therefore should be considered normal and okay? This, of course, is a claim that the world is making about a huge number of, of sins. I mean, everything from anger to drunkenness the sexual sins are all being blamed with this excuse, I was born this way. But in our day, there's an, there's an especially intentional and powerful effort to apply this excuse to the sin of homosexuality. There is, as you know, an aggressive movement to silence anyone who dares to challenge the gay agenda by labeling them bigots or even trying to charge them with hate speech crimes. And whole denominations of churches, out of fear of being viewed as old-fashioned and bigoted, have capitulated to this idea. And they have abandoned the view of morals and the view of marriage that the church has held for two millennia in order to appease the popular sentiments of the unbelieving world. But James chapter 4, verse 4, warns us against doing this. It says, Don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity towards God? Right? So the one who wants to make himself a friend of the world, who wants to please the world, winds up displeasing God. And so in their rush to please the world, these churches who have capitulated on this issue have greatly displeased the Lord. But what about the claim being made on a daily basis in the media and in the college classroom and in the high school classroom and in the junior high classroom and even in the elementary school classroom, even on cartoons and children's books? What about the claim that the church should stop teaching that homosexuality is a sin because, quote, they were born that way? Every single person in this room is facing an onslaught, an ideological onslaught from the world on this issue. If you work in a secular workplace, I guarantee you that you at some point will be subjected to what they call sensitivity training, which is really indoctrination in the view that homosexuality is okay, it's not a sin, and you shouldn't ever hold that view or say that view. If you're in the military, if you're in government, if you're in a student, wherever you are, you're going to be confronted with this. And even if you stay safely in your house, you're going to be confronted with this on the media, in the news, in every way and form. So what about that claim? What about the claim that it's okay because they were born that way? I want to just give you a few thoughts on the topic to guide your thinking and your conversations. First, I want to be clear that Scripture is clear on this issue. Absolutely clear. Biblically faithful Christians are not going to change their view of marriage no matter what percentage of Americans agree or disagree with us. Why? Because we didn't get our view of marriage from the polls, from politicians, or from the media in the first place. We got it from God from his unchanging word, and from the very order of creation. And no matter what you hear on the evening news, or no matter what you hear at the workplace, or in the university, it has not and will not and cannot change the Hebrew and Greek text of Scripture. Between 5 o'clock and 6 o'clock in the, uh, the evening, when the evening news reports this or that, the text of God's word has not changed. And Scripture is absolutely clear on this issue there are many passages, not just a few, many passages that teach that homosexuality is a sin, 
along with all other forms of sexual immorality, they are indeed sin, and they are rebellion against the created order, which is designed and regulated by God. No amount of hermeneutical or exegetical gymnastics can change that reality. Now, there are some that are making this attempt. They're trying to twist the Scripture, or they're trying to argue these texts away. But all of those attempts fail because they are logically incoherent. They are hermeneutically deficient. And the clear teaching of Scripture, which has been held by the church for thousands of years, is obvious in the text. And so, the popular media has taken to spreading the myth that, well, maybe the apostles, Paul and Peter, all, maybe they were just old-fashioned, bigoted hypocrites and defenders of the male patriarchy who ignorantly wrote against homosexuality, and maybe the Old Testament prophets were the same, but Jesus, they say, said nothing about homosexuality and did not condemn it. What do we think about that line of reasoning? Jesus did not specifically condemn homosexuality, and therefore it must be okay. We're reminded that there is a whole list of sins that Jesus did not specifically condemn. I, one that just popped into my mind as I was preparing was Jesus did not specifically condemn armed robbery. He did not. But his condemnation of it is included in what he taught about the evils of greed and of theft. And just like that, homosexuality is included in Jesus' repeated condemnation of sexual immorality. And his position on marriage, and therefore ours, was stated very clearly by him, by the Lord Jesus Christ himself in Matthew chapter 19. Please turn there with me. Matthew chapter 19, beginning in verse 4. The media constantly is making now this claim that Jesus was not opposed to homosexuality, that Jesus had an open view of marriage. And you wonder, have any of these folks actually read the words of the Lord in Matthew 19, verses 4 through 6? Here is Jesus' view of marriage. And he answered and said, this is what Jesus said, have you not read, let's pause there for a second, have you not read, read what? Read the Old Testament. Jesus here is affirming the inspired Old Testament scriptures and everything that's contained in them. All of the prohibitions, all of the moral and ethical code that it taught. Have you not read, and then let's continue, that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. I just want to make a few simple observations from the words of the Lord. First of all, it is a man who is joined to his wife. And to do so, he leaves his father and his mother not his father and his father, or his mother and his mother, but his father and his mother. And it is two, one man and one woman, who become one flesh. That is Jesus' view of marriage. So even if 99% of all Americans and all experts and all famous people eventually embrace same-sex marriage, I'm going to stick with Jesus on this issue. This church is going to stick with Jesus on this issue. Honest students of Scripture know what the Bible teaches about this. And that is why to escape the clarity of God's Word, the vast majority of unbelievers reject the biblical view of creation by God, and they embrace some form or another of Darwinian evolution. As their view of origins, they want to think that they were not created by God and therefore subject to his law, they want to think that they evolved from lower life forms and therefore are subject to nothing and no one. And they think that Darwinian evolution provides them with a logically coherent and morally sound reason to live the way they want to live. 
But this leads us to our next point. Unbelievers often have a serious internal contradiction in their worldview when it comes to this topic. Consider for a moment the unbeliever who simultaneously believes that he is the product of Darwinian evolution and that he is a homosexual whose inclinations are an entirely natural expression of the sexual orientation he thinks he was born with. Right? He simultaneously believes in Darwinian evolution and in his sexual orientation. So in one aspect of his worldview, he believes that natural selection weeds out traits which hinder successful reproduction. But in another aspect of his worldview, he believes that a trait which self-evidentially hinders successful reproduction is not at all a defect or unnatural or harmful in any way. But he, he can't have it both ways. He can't have it both ways. It cannot be that man developed through the process of natural selection which weeds out traits which hinder successful reproduction and then that a trait which does hinder successful reproduction is not a defect, unnatural, or harmful. Obviously, self-evidentially, before the invention of artificial insemination a couple decades ago, homosexuals had a 100% one-generation fail rate in pa passing on their genes. So if those traits were purely genetic, from an evolutionary point of view, the process of natural selection should have eliminated those genes long ago and cannot account for them ever rising. Even positing that the genes were passed on via bisexuality or are carried as recessive genes by heterosexuals does not enable them to escape from the obvious contradiction between their Darwinian naturalism and their claim that homosexuality is neither a defect nor a sin. There's an internal contradiction. Third, the studies they cite as evidence are heavily disputed. And contrary to popular perception, there is not a clear consensus in the medical community regarding the causes of homosexuality. A believing biblical counselor named Edward Welch, who graduated with his PhD in neuropsychology from the University of Utah, has a book that is called Blame It on the Brain. And he discusses a study done by two homosexual researchers, which is often cited in the national media. And he writes, this study would be better used to support the influence of peers in the development of homosexuality. The researchers realize that all they have proved is that homosexuality is not caused solely by genetics. If genetics were the only cause, the concordance rate in identical twins would be 100%. If one twin were homosexual, the other twin, having identical genes, would always be homosexual. And so he concludes, the findings of science support rather than challenge the biblical view. And he writes, the idea of homosexual orientation relies on neither biblical data nor medical research. Instead, it is a political premise for gaining same-sex marriage rights. That's a, a biblical counselor. But what about the secular medical professionals? Even a secular medical organization which has embraced the whole equality uh, framework of mind and the political correctness frame of mind, the American Academy of Pediatrics, states in their abstract, and I want to quote a few things from this abstract. They say, the mechanisms for the development of a particular sexual orientation remain unclear. Another quote, a variety of theories about the influences on sexual orientation have been proposed. Sexual orientation probably is not determined by any one factor, but by a combination of genetic, hormonal, and environmental influences. And then they say, there continues to be controversy and uncertainty as to the genesis of the variety of human sexual orientations. The American Academy of Pediatrics. In other words, the popular media is perpetuating a myth. They are perpetuating a myth that medical science has proven a biological and genetic cause for homosexuality. That is simply not the case. Medical researchers, researchers do not use terms like unclear, 
probably. A variety of theories have been proposed, or this continues to be an area of controversy and uncertainty for things that have been medically proven. The media presents to the masses a picture that biological and genetic causes have been proven, but the medical profession, when they are most honest, describes this as an area of controversy and uncertainty, where the reality is unclear and where different theories remain unproven. So take those things with a grain of salt. Fourth, what about the brain scans, right? You're always on the media, there's a brain scan that shows that this person's brain is different than this person's brain. The brain scans and, brain scans and other purported evidence of physical differences between homosexual and non-homosexual brains often reported in the media make a major assumption they make a major assumption. They assume that those physical differences are the cause of homosexuality and not the consequence of it. Researchers understand that establishing correlation is difficult, but distinguishing between cause and consequence is even more difficult. So let me give you just a simple example. If you compare the liver of an alcoholic to that of a non-alcoholic, you're going to see very distinct physical differences that can be shown on various scans and tests. But of course, no one is saying that sclerosis of the liver is the cause of alcoholism because we know that it is actually the consequence of alcoholism. So these brain scans showing that the brain of the homosexual is different than the non-homosexual homosexual, proves nothing because it could just as easily be the consequence of the behavior as it could be the cause. Establishing correlation is difficult, but distinguishing causation from consequence and establishing the connection between biological factors and human behaviors which are as complex as socially and religiously influenced and as individually varied as human sexual behavior is exceptionally problematic and many researchers believe is perhaps impossible. So the idea that science has proven a biological or genetic cause of homosexuality is simply not true. But let's ask the question, what if they did prove a link? Suppose a link were found. Suppose for a moment that a clear, unmistakable genetic or biological link could be conclusively proven. Would it be time for us as a church to change our position, cut pages out of the Bible, and join the crowd in affirming homosexuality as being normal, okay, not a sin? Would clear and undisputable, undisputable evidence of a genetic cause mean that homosexual, homosexuality cannot be considered a sin or any other sin? And the answer is, of course not. Of course not. Because such a conclusion rests on the false premise that we are born neutral or good. Whereas the Bible teaches that we are born totally depraved, and this includes both our spirit and our body. What you are born with is not necessarily good and right. In fact, the Scripture teaches the opposite. Consider for a moment the Bible's teaching on gluttony and the corresponding scientific position on obesity. Now, the Scripture clearly teaches that gluttony is a sin. But science can show that there are differences in the metabolism and appetites of people that are influenced by genetic factors. And clearly, some people have greater challenges in this area of temptation than others. And yet, in Scripture, gluttony is still considered a sin, no matter whether the person is born with a greater or lesser degree of susceptibility to a greater or lesser form of temptation in this area. And science also still considers obesity, which is the obvious consequence, not always the consequence, but is a direct consequence of gluttony, science still considers obesity to be harmful and something that requires loving and gentle intervention for the good of the person, for the good of human thriving, for their happiness, for their health. Likewise, there are many sins, whether it's alcoholism or sexual sins or other things, that one person may be more tempted towards than another. But the fact of temptation, 
The fact of sinful desire does not mean that the behavior is morally right. God is the one who determines that. That's why there's a fifth and even more important issue to point out when someone says, I can't help it, I was born this way. When an unbeliever says, I was born this way, he is usually assuming that that means that whatever he desires and however he lives must be normal and acceptable to God. The assumption is that whatever we are born with is by definition good, holy, and righteous and cannot be sin, but that is a false assumption. Listen to what the Scripture teaches. Psalm 51.5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Psalm 58.3, The wicked are estranged from the womb. Those who speak lies go astray from birth. Genesis 8.21, God says, The intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. I want you all to think about your own experience with sin, sinful desires. When did they start? When did you choose them? Do not we all have a sense that our sinful desires go back farther than we can remember? Our human depraved heart manufactures evil desires like a factory, and it does so, as the Scripture says, from birth. The wicked are estranged from the womb. Those who speak lies go astray from birth. The intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. So if someone makes the, hey, I was born that way argument, I would encourage you, don't argue with them about the scientific data. Don't argue with them about their personal experience, but rather gently and lovingly ask them, what do you think that proves? What have you proven? Because all you have done is agreed with the Bible that human nature and desires are totally depraved from the very beginning of our lives. All you have proven is that Romans 1, 25 through 32 accurately assesses the human condition when it says that because of man's rebellion, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. And in the list of sins given in Romans chapter 1, notice that there's a whole list of sins that are included. Sins that each of us is guilty of. And none of us can excuse our sin by saying, hey, I was born that way. If your sin is the sin of anger, you can't say, hey, I was born that way. In Romans 1, it lists disobedience to parents. You don't have to teach a child to be disobedient. He doesn't even have to learn it. He is by nature a rebel. And in that list of sins, we all find our guilt. And we all, in one sense, can say, I was born that way. But what is the moral implications of that? Making such a claim makes our moral and legal standing before God worse, not better. Saying, I've always wanted these evil things. I've always considered myself to be this. For as long as I can remember, I've wanted to do these evil things, and then I finally did them. That, my friends, is an admission, not an excuse. It's an admission of guilt, not an excuse. Even in human courts, we are more lenient with one-time accidental offenders than with repeat, habitual, intentional career offenders. And when you stand before God saying, hey, I was born with sinful desires, and then I spent my life indulging them, that is hardly going to be a winning defense at the judgment seat. I was born that way may seem like an exculpatory excuse right now. But on Judgment Day, it will just be an admission of intractable guilt and evidence that you're a sinner both by nature and by choice. So friends, as the Scripture warns, don't be deceived. Neither the drunkard, nor the adulterer, nor the homosexual, nor the swindler, nor the liar will be excused because they were born in sin. Paul says in our passage, we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. So, 
Does our problem go deeper than our choices? Yes, it does. It goes down to our very nature, which after the fall became depraved and enslaved to sin. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 15, 19, out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, sexual immoralities, thefts, false witness, slanders. These are the things which defile a man. And I want you to notice the plurals. He's saying the heart is an idol factory. It's a sin factory. It just produces sin. Sin flows out of it. Out of the heart come evil thoughts, plural. Murders, plural. Adulteries, plural. Sexual immoralities, plural. Thefts, plural. False witnesses, slanders. All of these things are things which defile a man. And they come, Jesus says, out of the heart. The deepest part of man. Ephesians 2.3 reminds us that the desires and inclinations of both our bodies and our minds are evil. He says, we too all formerly lived in the lusts, plural, the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath even as the rest. The world, the flesh, and the devil are all at work to to provide our evil hearts with plenty of temptation and plenty of opportunity, but it is the desire of the heart which latches on to it. We are all sinners, both by nature and by choice. We are sinners and we choose to sin. The alcoholic is a drunkard, and he chooses to drink. So we need to be saved from both. Both the sin nature and our sinful choices. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Here the Scripture is going to give us a warning, and as it, the Scripture often does, it begins with a warning and then offers hope. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Do you not know? Sometimes I, we need to pause there. Don't you know? Right? The writer is saying, look, this is something that you know. You should know this. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, right? No matter what the media says, no matter what your professor says, no matter what your sinful heart says, no matter what your experience says, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived by the world. Don't be deceived by the devil. Don't be deceived by your own heart, your own sinful heart. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. That's the warning. Now look at the hope, verse 11. Such were some of you, but you were washed. Washed how? Washed by the blood of Christ who suffered and died to free you from your slavery to sin. You were washed, you were sanctified, that means made holy. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Such were some of you. All right, and that's the message of Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Right, he says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. You formerly walked that way. We too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were, by nature, children of wrath, even as the rest. The message of Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 is that what you are can become what you were. All kinds of people are saying, hey, I am homosexual, or I am a drunkard, or I'm just this way. I'm just, you know, I just have a problem with anger. But what you are, as a slave to sin, can become what you were. There is hope, in other words. So, dear friend, if you're struggling with homosexuality, and statistically it's very likely that in a church this size there is someone who's struggling with those temptations, 
I want you to know there's hope. Hope given by God to you personally. I want you to know that you're loved. Loved so much that someone suffered an agonizing death on a cross for you. Love so much that Christ calls you to come unto him, to bring those heavy burdens of sin and guilt and let him take them from you, to free you, to change you, to save you, to transform you. And the same is true no matter what sin you're trapped in, whether it's drunkenness or fornication or greed or deception or slander, lying, theft, fraud, or whatever it is. What you are, as a slave to sin, can become what you were. You were dead in sin. You formerly walked. You were, by nature, children of wrath. And how did the transformation come? Look at verse 4. The two most amazing words in all of Scripture. But God. But God. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. For the past two and a half weeks, we've been studying the doctrine of human depravity. It's a hard doctrine. It's a tough doctrine. It's one that is that is hopeless and dark and discouraging. And if you're ready to move on to the light and the bright and the hope, I even more so am because I've had to spend two weeks studying the topic of human depravity in great depth. And here it comes, but God being rich in mercy. Remember what we learned in verses one through three? Our condition was death Our ruler was the devil. We were enslaved by our desires. We were totally depraved. We were justly damned. And then two words come into that darkness and change everything. But God being rich in mercy. Yes, you were dead in sin, but God made you alive together with Christ. You were of your father, the devil, but God rescued you from the kingdom of darkness and transferred you into the kingdom of his beloved son. You were enslaved to your own evil desires but God set you free. You were totally depraved in body, soul, and spirit. You had gone astray from birth, from your youth, but God made you a new creation in Christ. You were justly condemned to suffer God's wrath, but Jesus bore that wrath in your place, washed you, sanctified you, and clothed you in his righteousness. We were spiritually dead, but God, by grace, has given us a new life in Christ. Paul, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, like a master painter, in the first three verses of the chapter, has dashed the canvas of our hearts with the dark and hopeless hues of the realities of our depravity. But now, led by the Holy Spirit, he dips his brush into the brightest of golden hues and like the breaking of the morning dawn, a beam of hope pierces the darkness and awakens joy and hope and love in the human heart. Those who were dead in sin, ruled by the devil, enslaved to our desires, totally depraved and justly damned, now become objects not of wrath, but of mercy, of love, of grace, of a new life, in Christ. Freedom, salvation, hope, being born again, being made a new creation, and not by deeds, merit, or effort, but because of what God does for us by grace. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive Together with Christ, by grace, you have been saved. I want to close with a lengthy citation from George Whitfield. He was a famous evangelist of the Great Awakening, which was a huge revival which swept this country in the 18th century. And in this quote, he is comparing the regeneration of the sinner to the resurrection of Lazarus. Listen to what he says. He says, Come ye dead, Christless, unconverted sinner, Come and see the place where they laid the body of the deceased Lazarus. 
Behold him laid out, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, locked up and stinking in a dark cave, with a great stone placed on top of it. View him again and again. Go nearer to him. Be not afraid. Smell him. Ah, how he stinketh. Stop there now and pause a while. And whilst thou art gazing upon the corpse of Lazarus, give me leave to tell thee with great plainness, but greater love, that this dead, bound, entombed, stinking carcass is but a faint representation of thy poor soul in its natural state. Thy spirit, which thou bearest about with thee, sepulchred in flesh and blood, is literally dead to God, and as truly dead in trespasses and sins as the body of Lazarus was in the cave. Was he bound hand and foot with grave clothes? So art thou bound hand and foot with thy corruptions. And as a stone was laid on the sepulchre, so there is a stone of unbelief upon thy heart. Perhaps thou hast lain in this estate not only for four days as did he, but many years, stinking in God's nostrils. And, what is still more affecting, thou art as unable to raise thyself out of this loathsome dead state to a life of righteousness and true holiness as ever Lazarus was to raise himself from the cave in which he lay so long. Thou mayest try the power of thy boasted free will and the force and energy of moral persuasion and rational arguments. But all thy efforts, exerted with never so much vigor, will prove quite fruitless and abortive until that same Jesus who said, Take away the stone and cried, Lazarus, come forth, also quicken you. This is grace graciously offered, and grace graciously applied. God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Let's pray. Lord, I come before you amazed 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 that someone as evil both in nature and by choice as I am Lord that you would be merciful to me a sinner Lord that you would shed your blood for me suffer for me you would break the chains of sin and death upon me. Lord, this is mercy, rich and full. This is grace that is truly amazing. This is wonderment beyond all compare, Lord. We wonder at your love, your mercy, your grace towards us, helpless sinners, depraved, evil in mind and body. But Lord, how grateful we are to you for salvation for your love, for your mercy, for your grace, for the new life that you give to all and to any who will call upon you in faith. I thank you, Lord, that you beckon even now those who are weary and heavy laden to come and to lay their sin and their guilt and their burdens at the foot of the cross and embrace you as Savior and Lord and be born again into a new life in Christ. It is my prayer that that would be true for them this day as it was true for me many years ago. And we give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name.